to see you all here today. And it's a really great pleasure to introduce Henning to, uh, to Meyer. Uh, Henning, I'll do the official bits first, is the Professor of Social and Behavioral Science and the Felberg Chair of Maternal and Child Health at the Harvard uh, School of Public Health. And by training, Henning's a physician and a social epidemiologist, had his degrees from the University of Bonn in Germany and his PhD from Erasmus in uh, University in Rotterdam. And Henning's really been pivotal, absolutely pivotal in the success of one of the most impressive uh, birth cohorts worldwide, the Generation R cohort. It started with over 10,000 pregnant mums and has followed these kids from birth now into adolescence. And using these exceptionally rich data, Henning has published extensively on the origins of child developmental problems, uh, unraveling the interplay between genomics and the environment. And Henning's also played a major role in the equally impressive Rotterdam study, uh, which is focused on the other end of life. Uh, this study has produced literally thousands of publications on the origins of later life cancer and heart disease, many under Henning's leadership. Uh, Henning recently moved to Harvard, where he's planning really innovative new directions for his group, focusing on some of society's most vulnerable and uh, marginalized children. I'll just end by noting that I met Henning in 2005, 14 years ago, at the NAMIH, whenever we were both junior postdocs in the child psychiatry branch under Judy Rappaport. And there are three things to note here, three things to note. Uh, first of all, uh, working together as postdocs was the beginning of a very long and I think a very fun collaboration between my group and Henning's. Second thing to note is science is always much better whenever you do it with people you like doing it with. And finally, and most importantly, I think you'll all agree that neither Henning nor I have aged a day. So, <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Henning. Wow, what a sweet, what a special. Oh, I'll come every week to um, hear that. Philip, yes, thank you for the very kind invitation and the introduction. And good to be here. Hello. Yes, indeed. 2005, I came and uh, I introduced myself to Julia saying, I want to learn imaging to do a birth cohort. And she said, we don't need any birth cohorts anymore. What you? And I try to convince her that if we do imaging, it's worthwhile. And so 15 years later, she's not around. But I want to convince you that it was worthwhile. So because at that time, I knew nothing. About imaging. So here we go. Um, so this is the study I had. We had started that actually. In 2002, we started and then it was just data collection. So I took time off to come to Bethesda. It's talking, this whole talk will be about Generation R and a few sort of recent researches, sometimes up for discussion or to show what we're struggling with or how we address population neuroscience. So Generation R. The R stands for Rotterdam. Uh, it's a prospective birth cohort. So it started in fetal life or early fetal life. And we promised our funders to get 10,000 mothers and we nearly got there. I think we should have continued one more month to get it, but we sort of had an end date too. And the other thing which is not so relevant for today's talk, but is that Rotterdam is more than other Dutch or European cities, very multi-ethnic. So half of the population has parents born outside the country. That's a lot for a European city. That's in the League of Toronto. Um, so let me just briefly, very briefly, because it's always the boring part, introduce the study. So um, we, um, most of the women started in when they were pregnant. And why we got them into the study is we promised them very detailed ultrasound measures. And that's what they like. That's why they came. Some stopped immediately after <laughs> they had their fourth assessment, but many continue 15 years later. Um, so we did ultrasound. We did a few other measures, blood. It's important we got them from mothers, fathers, and child um, for much of our work. Um, and perhaps I don't want to go into that much. Questionnaires, a lot of questionnaires on child behavior cognition. That was the part I was responsible. And the MRI, which I had sort of this, that's why I came to Jay Geed's group uh, to learn population MRI. And some years later, when the children were six, we got the first pilot grant pilot for a thousand MRIs. We completed that successful. Then we got money partly from the university, 4,000, not all of them successful. So most of the data will be three and a half thousand. And up to that time, now overtaken by the ABCD, we were the biggest, biggest um, pre-adolescent imaging study in the world. And we have now completed three and a half thousand in the next wave, which would be 13, 14. I'll focus much of my results on the uh, at 10 wave of imaging. 
uh, because there we had a full, large part of the cohort. Obviously, it's only half of all the people that ever participated, but quite a good response rate. And we had other measures, which I'll mention on the way. So I'll start with, I squeezed in one more topic. I was going to start only with depression, the maternal depression. So we're looking at one of my research lines has always been prenatal exposures, relating the prenatal exposures to what happens to the child later, mostly neurodevelopmental being cognition or behavior or imaging. And this is the list of things we've studied. We're quite well published, for example, on things like thyroid, fatty acids. Cannabis use was, we had 200 women using cannabis during pregnancy, showing the effects, which are not that marked, so I won't tell you much about that. And so we have repeatedly measures, yeah, it's surprisingly little effect. Um, um, on depression is what I, and I squeeze in because we talked about two, three or two or three people I met today, we talked about family um, networks, so I have very unpublished recent work on family conflict, which I squeezed into this presentation. So the depression work was coming from the idea, depression was much related, has been related many times, prenatal or maternal depression at any time point to child development, not so much to brain development. And what we have is quite unique data. We had it from different, here's obviously the data, the questionnaires, I'll show you. So we have maternal depression data, which is in red, the red arrows at four different time points. So one is prenatal, then we have it actually, it should be at two months. So in the early postnatal phase, then we have it in childhood, I use the six year data, and we have it essentially cross-sectional with the MRI data at age 10. And the first thing, sort of, if you want to think with me, what we're trying to do was the idea, is there a time point when the depression is worse if you go by the MRI? So if you think, when does maternal depression, or when is it associated to any MRI changes? If it is, you could say prenatal, postnatal, childhood. But I'll give away, it's not at all time points, so it's only at some one, one time point. So you might think it's prenatal because that's when the brain grows fastest. And this is a very important, you know, the two months is a very important part for attachment. You could say this covers all the early childhood, or this is the most recent, which is essentially the cross-sectional, could be the strongest association too. So that's what we looked at, and we looked at it with uh, just very global volumetric, but also with DTI, that is white matter tract measures. And that's just our mock scanner, costs quite a bit of money actually, but what am I showing it for? These are the sequences here I'm talking about, the classical T1, this is a three Tesla, but this is a T1 sequence for structural and the DTI. It's quite known to people, just the classical. We also have a resting state, which I'm, I don't know why I put it away. And here are the results. So if you look at it quickly, um, what you'll see is, um, there's another probably more powerful pointer. What you see is we've got the different, four different time points, three months. It's actually three and six, it doesn't matter. I showed the three here, nine, two months, and postnatal. And then you see it's the first step is always for us to sort of hierarchical look at the total and then zoom in. So we look at total white matter and total gray. And there's nothing much at all with white matter volumes, and then there's something only here in the postnatal two-phase. So indicating that if there's an association, it would be with the postnatal two months. Now we looked at that further, now comes the white matter tracts. Uh, so these are global FA, very similar picture with MD, so global FA. Now you can look at it differently, I'll show you an easier picture that uh, take away one of the models. You can see again, it's very consistent, the white matter tract is only at age two months. There's no effect. The other thing perhaps to note is that there is a lot of confounding. So if you adjust for conflict and BMI and smoking during pregnancy, you get rid of quite a few effects. That's what I think some studies do poorly. But we found a very consistent effect on both the volumetrics and the DTI only with the early postnatal depression. And that was part of the story, which was a bit surprising. I would have, I don't know, I got my money with prenatal research, so I always think it's prenatal. Often it is not, I can tell you that. Um, and here again, it is not, it is the early postnatal. Actually, some psych, uh, child developmental people predicted it. I've given this talk before, and the more you're in child development, the better they can predict that. Um, but then we thought, 
the following, it went on the story a bit, that really, you know, is this bit of a chance finding? Is this really a pattern? Note that this was not a repeated measures analysis. This was a simple one-on-one, -on -one. so one measure not adjusting. So you could do that a bit more sophisticated. Um, you could try trajectories, or at least look at trajectories. So we did trajectories to see what is the pattern. You know, are these the same women at different time points? And that actually is a bit the story. So if you look at the trajectories, one of them, I'll warn you, this purple one or whatever color that is, is a bit unstable. It's quite a small group. But then there's a big group that has no symptoms, as always. There's some. But then there's one group, and that's a remarkable group, that has clinical symptoms throughout. So this is the cutoff of this specific measure of depressive symptoms. The clinical cutoff is somewhere here. So these are women that are at every time point above the clinical cutoff. So there's a small group only in Generation R, but that's actually not so different than in other ages of women that have very high, clearly always above the clinical cutoff. So three, two, two or three percent of the total population, not those that are imaged, but it's three, three point five percent that have high. And these women who always have these high symptoms, they just peak after pregnancy. So essentially it's that is the typical pattern. And if we look at relating our outcomes, for example, these uh, white matter tracts to these patterns, essentially you have much less power because you just have four groups, but you still find that that one fairly small group of being high and then going down a bit, um, that explains what we find. So I would warn anybody to say it's just one time point. What it really is, it's probably the children of one group of women that have um, these slightly, well, altered or changed or perhaps differences in white matter. And um, these mothers always have the symptoms. They just peak after pregnancy. So that's a bit of a different interpretation, which I think is a bit more solid. And that, in other words, I think, well, this is where if you look at individual tracts, which you could say it doesn't really, I don't want to go into that. I think um, this critical period um, approach, which many people take nowadays, and it's very fancy, sensitive periods, it does not work with depression. It does not work with depression because of the high correlation of the exposure at periods. If you really are not adopted away, let's say, then likely that there is always something ongoing or that your mother is, has very few um, depressive symptoms. So there is a high, if you wish, carryover effect of the exposure among these periods. So I think if you want to study these sensitive periods, you might do it with thyroid hormones and other things, but not so much with depressive symptoms. And then there's another interpretation, um, which is a bit at odds with some of it, but it also is fascinating to think there is some evidence that postnatal depression or postnatal depressive symptoms could be very different, actually some say more genetic than um, childhood depression when you're very stressed by your job. It's this very biological roller coaster of your hormones that pushes some people who are vulnerable into um, depression. Hello, welcome. <laughs> welcome, Didi. Um, no, that was the first. So I think I, that is that. Now, now I want to talk, I didn't even have an introduction slide, so it's a bit of a jump. I want to talk about the family conflict. And that's just because I think it's a different picture to contrast that, a different exposure. So we're talking now about a study of two and a half thousand, very similar in numbers. So two and a half thousand children, again, with imaging at age 10. And here we measured family conflict um, at three time points prenatally at age six. That's why this time it is age six and age 10. And family conflict are things that's quite a long list of 12, 13 questions. You know, we can't trust each other or in family planning, it's difficult because we always misunderstand each other. That is not full blown conflict. You know, it's not like I beat my wife, but actually we've shown that that is a very sensitive measure, a very good predictor of divorce. Oh my God, you know, if you have that, then every standard deviation will just give you quite a bit of divorce risk. You know, sometimes in hindsight, I've just published that this year, how much that predicts. It's very, very remarkable, that prenatal family conflict. And it's actually very interesting. We have it in mothers and fathers. And I can tell you another thing. The maternal measure is so much more predictive. So if a mother or a woman in pregnancy says, I can't trust my husband, um, that's predictive of poor family and marriage and child outcomes. So I was very interested in this measure um, um, 
in relation to child brain development, again, arguing that it, it captures, you know, it's not an etiological study, but it captures many, many things, but it's a very um, sensitive marker of problems uh, in that. And then I was, I'm also interested, I'll come to that later in a minute, in the child behavior measured at the same time. So this time in depression, we didn't do that, but in this paper, I want to factor in the child behavior. So here's again where we, and we measured it, so it's a bit of different time points. Um, we measure temperament and other things, but this is what I'm showing you. It's a very, I don't want to spend too much time on the analysis, perhaps important, we do quite stringent correction for multiple testing, quite a lot of confounders. I want to point out that we control for maternal psychopathology. Some people think that's um, an intermediate of family problems, that you get depressed because your husband is so ugly, but actually you can also argue that you have many fights. You, you know, you're very neurotic and that's why you have family fights. So in case of doubt, I always adjust. Um, and you can take and pick it. That's what I really want to show. And then we looked at gender effects, both in parents and, but I'll quickly show you the results of, to show you something. So there's nothing much, certainly if we correct for multiple testing, we don't see these overall white matter and effects as we saw for depression. It's perhaps, yeah, it's, it's, well, yeah. But we do see, no, that was not there for cerebral white matter, but we also had an idea that we looked at amygdala and hippocampus because um, this, if it's early in life, it could be affected and that's what you see. So we rarely see uh, subcortical effects on the child brains at age 10 when we use measures at age five and at age nine, which I think makes sense outside really severe child abuse. There's very little idea that your hippocampus once you're age six, seven will sort of shrink that much because of, or grow le less because of family conflict. But this was quite a, you know, it's corrected for multiple testing. It's quite a strong, um, there should be 004 actually, typo there. Um, so that's, an, and it shows, this is the test of is, are these different ages different, the effects? Yes, very much so. So just to show you a very different pattern, how that contrasts, and it doesn't change whether you're correct for depression or not. And then one thing what I, fascinates me, just to mention, we have shown in a paper, which I'm not presenting today, that if anything, it's more child behavior that predicts uh, brain development if you measure it, for example, with white measure. So it's, that's our American Journal of Psychiatry paper where we show, so again, child behavior predicts child behavior problems, internalizing behavior, withdrawn behavior predicts how your white matter tracts develop, rather than that your white matter tracts predict the change in behavior. So since that paper, I'm always putting be behavioral problems as a mediator. Of course, that's a bit tricky because we don't know the hippocampal volume at all these different ages. But again, it shows that these probably either go parallel or perhaps that the child we don't know drives this. But we can at least see that this conflict really to very strongly um, does is associated with behavioral problems very early. And these correspond to at age 10, the hippocampal. It is not a sort of causal mediation analysis, but a very interesting that it is corresponding not just to brain changes, it does correspond to behavioral changes in these children too. They go together. That is family conflict. I like the story actually even better than the um, depression. So that's, um, yeah, that's just, in, that's not important. And perhaps one, because of a Harvard student, I want to show one result of a Harvard student now that I moved, the rest is all Rotterdam students still, that he analyzed the white matter tracts. And again, you see a very similar picture that the prenatal functioning rather than the mid-childhood family functioning is associated to global. And of course, once we see global, we can then zoom in on the individual tracts, but I'm always first interested because otherwise we do hundreds of tests. Is there an overall picture? And many of these early life, I don't expect them to be very specific. I don't see why should something prenatal have an effect. So I look at global effects first and you see it. Okay, so I'll do, I have enough time to do another jump. Do interrupt if you have urgent questions, please do. But otherwise I'll move on with another topic. Um, do imaging and then see if there's room for genetics. I hope not. Um, uh, I made to give a genetics talk, so I've got a few handful of genetic slides at the end. Um, seriously, brain imaging and child psychiatry. So understanding externalizing problems. So one of the things that I got a grant a few years back to um, relate externalizing problems to imaging, essentially nearly cross-sectional. It was a nice big grant. 
So what you sometimes have the luxury, and it works quite well if you put two PhD students next to each other on a similar project, because if they don't need to become friends, but if they work together well, it really does. It's the output just explodes. Honestly, that's my impression. And so I had to. But then the problem was that um, two things happened. One is you have to have good ideas for two students. You know, just one idea won't do. So you have to come up with more ideas. And secondly, we did a sort of pilot study, and we just took the imaging parameters. That's the sort of preamble of this talk, and related it to externalizing symptoms as measured with the CBCL. There was no association. So essentially, I had two students, um, one idea, and a negative finding. And so we sat together and said, that's not going to work. We have all room to do other things and just pretend it's externalizing problems. Or they said, we have to dig deeper. And it can't be, we thought, that um, there is nothing there. So we had, so one said, we will split further the externalizing, and the other said, we will lump externalizing. I'll show you the two ap approaches. Also note that once we got going, we contacted other people, the Imogen, also, um, um, who else? Jim Hudzik. I don't know what data he was working on. And he also had found nothing much was externalizing. Very simple. In the general population, we're not talking about conduct disorder in severe clinical cases. What we're talking about is, you know, aggressive behavior in the general population, where we see, you know, it doesn't correspond to big changes of the brain. Okay, so then we had two approaches. So first we come to the, uh, the lumping. So here's the, that's Alex, actually. It's a true story. So Alex is the lumper. And the background is the NIH sample image, and they found nothing much. Um, so we thought we'll start reconsider the phenotype, we'll lump. And what we did is um, we know, and that's essentially, the story of that is we started with this, at that time, quite a hype, or still a hype, the P-factor hype. And so everything is correlated with everything story. So you know that, you know that not only depression is correlated with anxiety or depressive symptoms, anxious symptoms, but we also know that, you know, aggressive symptoms in the general population, but also in clinical populations are associated with anxious symptoms. So... The idea essentially behind this is we don't find anything much because if we have a child who's externalizing, he's probably also got some degree of anxiety. So this is a, one of the classical figures, but I'll show you the Generation R model based on the following. We have it based on the CBCL data first at age five, but later we also combined two waves. So essentially it's a cross-sectional study, but with behavioral data from two waves at age six and at age 10. And then if you have this typical behavioral phenotype, what you get is um, externalizing behavior and internalizing behavior. And that sort of loads on classical at that time, that age attention. Later, it is more rule breaking and aggressive behavior. And then you've got these typical anxious or emotionally reactive or withdrawn symptoms. And then there's some others. So and then what um, if you know the. P factor model, what Ben Leahy introduced it, he called it, of course, differently. He called it the general, general um, psychopathology factor, which is a complicated name. So um, Caspi um, coined it P factor. They said that we know that there is a relation between externalizing and internalizing. And they said if you have another factor which loads essentially on all the different scales, this is what happens. So it's a general psychopathology factor loading on everything. That is essentially one trait that describes your degree of vulnerability, of symptoms of any psychiatric problem. It's been studied by a few people, and it sort of will show later, but we also find it. it's related to intelligence. It's related, you can relate it. It's also been shown it's related to severe child abuse. It's related to um, some, you know, very strongly, for example, to neuroticism and generally, essentially severe, um, yeah, the degree of psychiatric problems. If you have that in the model, note that it does not load on internalizing, externalizing. However, what happens, and that's psychometrically not so easy to understand, the meaning of internalizing and externalizing changes. Because essentially what you had now in the earlier model, you had aggressive behavior and attention together is ex inter externalizing. But now much of these problems is described by the general factor. So this is the externalizing now is what is left after you've taken that out. Meaning it is what you what is left is the we could call it the specific externalizing 
or it's something that is left and relates to aggression, aggression once you've con yeah, residualized or whatever you want to see it, say it, taken out the total problems. And um, let's take that forward. So this is another factor from, there's different variants from Ben Lehi. This is one of the first where he did it in 2012. He had this general factor and externalizing, and then he got two different internalizing, but it's very much the same. Um, okay. Now, um, let me just go through that quickly. So we did that in a big group. Um, we also very carefully have multi-informant, so we make it really theoretical now. We use multi-informant to get a very specific and very stable uh, these measures. And this is a very complex model. I don't want to go into it just to show you very quickly, but it's really complex. So it's nothing that sort of is suitable for individual diagnosis. It's a very group uh, latent variable describing the structure of psychopathology in the population. And then you see what I find quite interesting, how these factors, now it's not, this is thus the specific internalizing. It's not the internalizing, it's the specific. So once the general factor is taken out, say that again, for example, if you have negative affect, you know, it is still related to internalizing, not at all to externalizing anymore. That's what you really want to see, that you have an externalizing factor that's not related to affectivity, but it is related to strongly to something like surgency. So I have argued, and I don't know whom I told that today, um, that it, it becomes like a bit of a, oh yeah, Didi, we spoke about that. It becomes a temperamental trait to some extent. I think that's sort of one of the best ways of, in the CBCL, this measure of child behavioral problems, there is, of course, temperament in it. And if you take out the problems, you could argue that what you're left with here has something more. It's not temperament merely, but it is something more of temperament than psychiatric problems. And what I was, it's quite heritable, we showed. So this is a SNP heritability, which is comparatively high for child behavioral trait. You can't compare it with a sort of twin study heritability. So that's quite high. It's quite remarkable. We published that. Quite surprised how heritable it was in even a sort of smaller study. And then we looked at the neurobiology, the imaging. And what do we find? What would you predict? We looked at the white matter integrity again. So that's the bit of the theme of today with this um, <clears throat> externalizing, but also is the general factor. And it's 3,000 children, so that's quite a sizable study where we could define the um, P factor of 3,000 children with MRI at age 10, and then also the... Um, and I told you when we just looked at internalizing or externalizing, we found nothing with DTI, just to repeat that. And so this is the essentially model. You've got on the one hand, the white matter tracts, and then you've got, we actually at that age had to take out attention because it didn't load, um, it, it was a separate factor. Um, so we had the general factor, internalizing, externalizing, and also attention. That's important to realize at older ages, attention goes out of externalizing. And this is the imaging protocol. Um, and then we find what we expected. So the general factor is very significantly, if you even if it just for many confounders, related to, that's what I'm trying to say, less white matter integrity. Now, that's actually not so sensational, not at all, actually. You know, you've got this, like, showing that if you lump all the problems, then you do find something. Okay. But what I found, I'm not saying it's sensational, but it's quite remarkable, is that externalizing, we also find something, but it's a different direction. So all of a sudden, you do find something for externalizing, and that is, um, mean, to me, it means that if we take an artificial, I admit, artificial construct of pure externalizing without any of the problems, which essentially doesn't exist in any one person, but then we could see that there are two different things going on, and that's probably why we find so little. There are this sort of impulsive, if you wish, this sort of outgoing outwardness, which goes together with more microstructure, and at the same time in these children, if they are in real life, they do have problems, then you also see that they have something of the general factor, and that goes the other way. So essentially, you could argue, that's what we try to do, it cancels out. There's nothing much for it. Actually, attention is the only different one. If we take not specific attention, but attention without that correction, we do see less white matter. That is the whole picture. So that's the only one. Internalizing, well, however we do it, we find nothing. Okay, so that summary of one approach that if you lump, I would call that the lumping is, yeah, it's lumping, then you might understand better. And then the other student is splitting. So he um, 
had the generation data at the same ages, and but he also went to he said, I'll refine the externalizing phenotype. And I know my mentor, Frank Verhul, said when he heard that, he said, oh my God, you're number 120 in my career that's trying to refine the externalizing phenotype. I can't even stand it anymore. And he, I don't know, he didn't want to, he said it was just stupid. Um, but we pushed through anyway, taking several, pop this is quite a complicated study statistically, so we took the data of different population registries who have the CBCL, but also a clinical sample to show whether our subphenotyping would hold. And it's, um, <clears throat> we showed, it's, it's called sort of a mixed factor, it's a very complicated approach, combining both latent classes, but also different factor solutions. But it's actually only the factors that do it well. There's no classes much. We get very much the same as the 120 before us got. We got the well-known uh, factors, if you wish, the physical aggression, the rule breaking, which is more the conduct disorder or this, yeah, and the disobedient, which is more the oppositional. The only perhaps a bit interesting thing would be that we found the irritability as a very standalone dimension, not as Ajiris, Ajiris would say, it's part of the oppositional. We see it really as a standalone aggressive uh, trait. So that would be this, you know, emotionally reactive aggressive type. So we have these four. And now comes another question, like with the depression. If you have these four dimensions, which or which one or more of these are related to um, white matter changes would be the next question. So that was the question of Kuhn, the second student. So once he published this, he immediately went forward and um, um, said, which of them <coughs> uh, is related to white matter changes. And let me tell you, in this study of 2,600, there's just one trait of the four that's related with a modest effect, and that's the smallest group, if you wish, so less, least prevalent trait is the rule breaking is related. So conduct is order. Not such a surprise. The only frustration is that this not so surprising finding, which is, you know, nothing here and a bit here, published most easily. Well, as the lumping is really, people don't like it at all. So, it, you know, I don't think he won the scientific debate, but he certainly won the publication race. Um, so if you split, you can split. People have split before. If you look at children with externalizing traits in summary, what does really change, even if you don't take out the psychopathology, what is related to changes in the brain is the very small group of children that have rule breaking. And then you must think of children that already at the age of 11 sort of skip class without the mothers knowing. In generation R, that's a very small group that is truant at that uh, age. So that's that. Summary of rule breaking is a rather severe um, uniquely associated with rule breaking. And that's what I haven't shown you. It's nice that it's sort of consistent frontotemporal tracts, perhaps what people would, yeah, not so surprising. Um, so this disruptive, these different dimensions may help because in the general population, I can tell you, we and others have not found much with just taking the simple externalizing approach. I'll show you uh, one or two more results quickly rush through them because I have to do some genetics. But you can have a question. This is a good moment. So, I was in the train. Those that have trained. Um, so, what, it doesn't seem like a big uh, win for population neuroscience. And I wonder if you would say, like, if you had had the same amount of participants, but half a year case have controlled or some other design like that, you might have detected something else. And I'm wondering how these results compare to your image. That's a brilliant question, um, and that'll fill the rest of the 20 minutes, and I can avoid the genetics. Um, seriously, Stephen, um, there's a few aspects of this. One is power, and again, it, we talked about that. Power, I think population, people completely get the power wrong in a way if they talk to people with case control studies, because if you have two extremes, of the, you know, I said it's not a normal distribution, but it's sort of the skewed distribution, but you take the very normal and the very extreme. If you have 200 of that, you probably may have more power than our 2,000 because you're contrasting two extremes. So I think for power, 
we are overblowing the population base. That's part of the answer. So we're saying, oh, you have to do these big studies. But really, of course, most people have a bit of symptoms or no symptoms, and you have so many essentially controls. Essentially, it's like a 10 to 1 design. Uh, and even in GWAS, they get it wrong. I think it's very hard to do a good power calculation with a general population because the trait is so skewed and uh, that makes it out. Now comes, I think, the beauty of these population approaches is in something else. We can control for confounding much better. And I do think that thus we can get rid of some of the background effects. Uh, and perhaps I should start differently. If you review the literature, which we did for, or always do for these traits, you know, there is no one finding. There's hundreds of findings or completely all over the place. So if I sometimes do the joke and say, can you find, you know, that autism is related to this part of the brain and you name it, it's parietal, it's occipital, they'll find a study. Um, so I think that is for several reasons. It's multiple testing problems. It's... Um, poor control for confounding, and I think, and that's what I would argue, they not, don't have the possibility to, um, um, it's not so much confounder control also, it's to use um, other traits and control for anxiety. Because let's say if you have a control set that has no anxiety, no aggression, and you contrast it with those that have anxiety, aggression, attention problems, you can't control for subtypes anymore because the, the one of the groups, the empty cells. And if you take, Jay, you know, many of the designs, we can show that um, that's not working. Other things are control for IQ or the whole debate that, you know, the contrasting groups have an IQ difference of 15. That's much more where I think um, many of the poorly designed uh, case control studies struggle. And that is why I think, um, however, the downside of population research is, as I said, its power in a way that it's overblown. And secondly, of course, we lose many of the severe kids to non-participation. And if you have poor that, then what are you talking about? You know, a tiny bit of aggression? Um, so it's not one or the other. I think well-conducted needs goes for both, otherwise it doesn't work, so look at it carefully. But I do think we need this population approach for something like a P factor or whatever it is, or controlling for anxiety or so. Yeah. I don't know if that convinces you, but okay, good. Then I'll have to go on. Um, so here we go. So I'm talking about something else, which is a sort of hobby from mine, and I'll tell you a tiny bit. The story was that in Generation R, one of day we discovered that our ethical board said we have to do ethical consent after birth again because any consent for a non-living child does not go when you have a child in the Netherlands, you have to consent again. And if you have to consent, you have to do consent in face-to-face. -face. And we had no money to bring the people in, so we were quite lost. So if we had to send out a question there, we would have to consent them. So I was charged with solving that, and they gave me a bit of money. And so I said, this is not enough money to go to anybody. I can't do it. And so I was lost. And then I got money, or we got money, but I was in charge of it um, to get money for unemployment. I remember that exactly for to hire people that have been unemployed for a while to go to the people's home. So I was part of a training team to train. I don't know. Honestly, it was a team of six women, elderly women mostly, who had been unemployed for years. And then I said, well, if we do this and we had a good atmosphere, I said, I'll train you to do more. I'll train you to do not only do the concert, I'll train you to do home observations and I'll train you to do neurological examinations. And I had a series of, I remember very well, I call it the pizza evenings because they always wanted to eat pizza, which I don't like. So we ate pizza together and I tried to train them with a friend of mine who was a um, physiotherapist in neurological examinations, which was a lot of fun, I can tell you. So I had this team and actually they became quite reliable. And they became wonderfully, wonderfully reliable. I took them, you know, it was very, very, very nice. And I learned to understand uh, a slang of Rotterdam, which I really, you know, never had the chance to hear. So they did, they went to four and a half thousand homes to do neurological examinations, which each of them took 15 minutes. And that was a beauty. And they did home observations, so they recorded, and I sent them to the toilets to wash their hands, and they recorded whether these toilets were filthy or not. And... Um, that was quite a remarkable investment. I just had such fun with these 
team. So this is now years later revisiting that data in the following. So then this is what they had to do. You know, they didn't learn these words. So I had to explain that to them. But they did all these examinations of tonus and, you know, move. And we did it with dolls. And we, you know, one of them had some of the students even find small babies to train the, these things because these were elderly women and they had to train on somebody. So, you know, they had to, know, to do this. And they did it quite well. Um, so, yeah, we've got a good reliability. So I, we moved forwards. And then now that I'm jumping to, so when we took the genetic data, note that in Notre Dame, our genetic samples are always much smaller because we always have to exclude half the population, which is non-Dutch. And then for some, we don't have genetic data. So if we do 4,000 very quickly with loss to follow-up, it's not that big, but uh, mostly non-Dutch, which is exactly, well, not exactly half, we are ending up with... 1,500 where we still have genetic data and this analysis we did. So I'm just showing a few things because I want to get to a different point really. This is a nice publication. We showed that in a, such a small sample, we could show that um, the schizophrenia PRS, and Philip was saying everybody does PRS, so we also did the PRS. We did the P PRS for schizophrenia and we found an association. And the interesting thing is with mania, the PRS for mania was the other direction, which is showing that schizophrenia, they were essentially neuromotor delayed, with mania risk scores, they were neuromotor advanced, which is actually not what I had expected, but it was very clear. So that was a nice story. Here is just the story I should have perhaps ordered it differently, showing that the motor score, if you have um, low motor scores, gives you high symptoms. If you have a good motor development, you have low symptoms, and that's very, you know, that stays with you. So we found that the motor development at age six weeks reliably predicts internalizing, not so much externalizing, but internalizing problems is related to the genetics of schizophrenia. And here also to the um, autistic traits. So we measured at age six, this is, we measured autistic traits. And again, we found that if you have a low muscle tone, for example, hypertonus, low muscle tone, your uh, association, it predicts, if you wish, um, uh, autistic traits later in life. I found that quite fascinating. Now comes something, it becomes more and more complicated. And then I'll show you something about, um, yeah, I have time about pleiotropy. But here, so we're still talking about uh, motor development. Um, what we really measured is did it quite well as the tonus, then responses where you must think of reflexes and senses, that sort of startle reflex. That's also senses is eye, how, you know, does it make eye contact? We measured those things. Does it seem to hear? And they get points for all of that. And what you see is that a very different pattern. You can't see anything here, but that's because it's so light. What you see if you do the ADHD risk score, it predicts only those senses. If you take the autism polygenic risk score, it predicts the tonus very strongly and to something, well, mostly the tonus. But what is then also interesting, you can see that this polygenic risk score of autism predicts the motor development and later the autistic traits, but also the ADHD, Philip says it's related to everything indeed, it's related to autistic traits too. But we can even run a mediation model showing, and that's a tricky one, what does a mediation model mean here, is um, that the risk of autism genes predicts the tonus and predicts the autistic. If you put it into one of these classical mediation models, you will find an indirect effect from autism via the motor development on that, which would suggest, and there are trials that make that um, plausible, that if you have sort of poor um, motor development, that either is an early phenotype of autism, or it could mean that it is an risk factor, that means it contributes to the development of withdrawn behavior, which is a bit tricky, but it's probably an early phenotype or it's part of a pleiotropic effect that it does something with your neurodevelopment, be it motor or be it. So essentially, if you take these models, it could be the true sort of pleiotropy, it does motor and autism. It could be that it does, if this one or you know that one doesn't really matter, if you've got the genetics, it goes through the motor development and then later to autism. And you can think of 20 other variations if you play around how it relates. I don't really care, but it, you know, essentially Philip would say it publishes well. I think what you learn from it is the serious thing is that um, 
of all the um, uh, developmental measures, I think it's quite remarkable the um, relation with autism and motor was the most striking. Let me summarize it that way. And I do feel, I don't think it's much, I don't really know what it is, whether it's this causal mediation, but I do think it is and sort of yeah, an early symptom of this vulnerability later. And that was quite remarkable. I'll show you something else about the pliotrophy, and that's what I added, because I'll tell you, we were in a record store, I remember having a coffee, and we were talking about G by E, and I, was, I promised you one day to show you the slides on my pliotrophy, which is sort of stalled, but here it is. I discovered the slides I'd made, and I never gave the talk before, so it's a quite a risky thing, and I have 10 minutes. So here we go. Um, on pleiotropy at that time when I was sort of hobbying around and see and hear what you think of genetics. Not show you more PRS, I'll show you something very different. So a fascination of mine has been the idea what, you know, as you notice from this thinking about that is how much of that is there. And we've all got this cross disorder trait literature and all that. So when you think of pleiotropy, uh, you have genes that are associated to many outcomes. And um, I'll show you what, if you look at the way many people, it's changing now, I'm probably, this is too late, but what's been for a while, what they have done is that they have um, done two GWASs, and uh, both of them have a hit, and then they say, oh, this is pleiotropic. You know? That's interesting. And that's what you see, and then they sort of take, for example, the first papers from Smuller and Lancet, he says, Every, I'll take all those above the cutoff, and I'll take all above the cutoff, and then he sort of does a circle and says those overlapping ones are the pleiotropy. That's essentially descriptive pleiotropy. Because what I would be much more interested is in something, it's not these two, it's something like that. That there is um, a subthreshold hit, which is nowhere near significance, but it's subthreshold in two traits, meaning that it's, this is easy to discover, but the question is how many of those are there? So where there's a quite a clear signal, far from significant, and quite a clear signal, and that is. Let me tell you, if you look at the literature, if you look at, for example, what they do very often is the Fisher meta-analysis of p-values to combine two GWASs to find pleiotropic hits, what they do is, they, what you find is such a heat map, meaning that if, if pleiotropy is essentially, um, pleiotropic genetics is red, and this is the p-value of one trait, this is the p-value of other trait, it's really driven by a significance, you know, um, on one of the two. Um, uh, it's essentially driven, I don't know what one and zero means. I, say, I was, take it as, um, I got lost here, but what I mean is really, let's say, um, that would be, p-value is zero, that would be very significant. So essentially you want, um, let me, leave that, it confuses me now. What you want is not a pleiotropic hit being defined by that the association is genome-wide significant and overwhelming in the other, other in one trait and absent in the other. You will see if you calculate pleiotropy, what you want is a certain signal in both, not just an overwhelming signal in one, and very little in the other. And that's what I try to depict here. Um, I think I could get the story if I had three tries, but I won't bore you, as long as you follow me. So what I'm not so interested in, that you say, let's say, this is a genome-wide significant hit for schizophrenia, which is whackingly significant. Some of them you'll easily find a significance of 10 to the power of minus 12. And then you say, there's a bit in depression, nothing much, but together it becomes significant. What you really want is a certain substantive signal in both of the traits. And essentially, you don't want, and that's what I try to depict, you want this area, not just the extremes. So if one player is close to zero, to report significant part of the value from the second can take in value even one. That's what I was trying to say. It doesn't matter. So. I'll skip this, it's just that, um, no, I'll skip this, this is what it's about. What, what I thought of that we can simply do is something very old, you know, when I did statistics things on a sort of, not on a computer, but on a calculator, at that time I always did for some things, some rank testing, because it's very easy to do by hand. So I remember that, the sum ranking. So I essentially said, if we just simply sum rank um, the tests, we could think of the ranks in two GWASs. 
and um, we could combine that. And that's where my sort of knowledge ended. That's what I wanted to do. So I found a statistician in Rotterdam who did the math for me and said, actually, that would work as a pleiotropy model that you do some ranking. Very simple, but it works. The first problem we had to overcome, so what is the chance to have a SNP with rank 1 and 2 if there are 10 million variants? So if you have, what is the probability of rank 1 and rank 2? And, you know, it's... Um, it's got to be the same, so it doesn't matter which one. So that's one thing you want. If it's rank one and two, or two and one, should be the same probability. So essentially, you want the rank, and you can do that. And the first thing we came across, of course, that which makes it very tricky, and much of the pleiotropy anyway, not only our model, is the linkages equilibrium that you have quite of blocks of um, SNPs that go together. So I'll tell you, we did account for that. We essentially took the rank we did something which is much more the rank of a block rather than a single SNP. Otherwise, you get quite confused. So you saw that based on the summary statistics. So that would be the rank of that. Or you jump there. So note that it does, yeah, you adapt that. It doesn't, the whole block gets the fifth rank, not one, two, three, but the whole block gets that rank of the middle. So you do the blocks only, you rank it that way. And, um, so it's, I, can, I can skip the math, first of all, because I don't understand it, but you want to, it is about um, uh, two things. This would be I would be the different SNPs, and M would be the different, um, different phenotypes you combine. You can not only combine two, you could combine three. So you could do depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, you combine that and do the same theory. But the interesting thing is you can boil that down to quite a simple... Well, I, I, didn't I can understand it if somebody really takes me by the hand and threw it, but it, is, it boils down to a neat... A mathematical formula where you can take the ranking of these p-values to the power of um, the phenotypes you're studying. And then what we did is, this is just the theory, I'll show you examples in a minute and then finish off. Um, we get a very different heat distribution. That was, I was That's easier to explain, where you see this is what you want. You get a very neat, very different distribution. So that was simulated data where you see that it goes differently, meaning that here you become a uh, trait uh, SNP becomes significant if there's a certain amount, whatever that is, of signal in each of the traits. So you get much more hits of the, the middle area. So we worked with that. It's different. We did then simulated data so that we found simulated it with no hits, so it didn't produce any artificial hits. That's quite confusing, uh, comforting, that's quite nice. So one of the things always is you've got this wonderful method and you put non-informative data into it and then you do find many hits. Well, we don't, so that's good. And then, so we did that, but then we did it with real data. Um, and there's an interesting case because Barbara Franke, who's a friend of mine in Nijmegen, another Dutch city, she published that there was no overlap in subcortical structures and schizophrenia um, and there was no pleiotropy, which was a bit disappointing because everybody had hoped that that would be an endophenotype, Philip, and it seemed to be not, or it was underpowered. And we think we could show that it's a model problem because when we ran it, we got um, quite a few hits. You think, why on earth would they be um, credible? Well, there's many things you can argue with the biology. I can just show you this is a fun exercise to think of pleiotropy, but the best thing is that this was quite... Um, remarkable that you know there was it was more intergenic than we would by far have expected by chance and the other thing of course which I love really I want to point out that there's always not so much there's much more in schizophrenia and education that's also published much more uh, pleiotropy in different directions which is also fascinating to understand the brain if you wish um, I think that's the whole so the call here is and we can do that for different the Barbara Franca's uh, cortical thickness schizophrenia. We also did it for depression, bipolar schizophrenia. There, we did not find that much more than has been described, although we did find some other things. And now I lost the slide, which I had added somewhere. This is the slide I wanted to add of that's the, between the five different psychiatric phenotypes. You find some that have been well described as being pleiotropic, very, very well described, we find, with our mother, mother method. And if you go through them, we have quite some reason to believe that they are not chance findings. It's a very neat way, a very simple way, essentially, of doing pleiotropy. And note there's very little sort of pleiotropy GWAS, which is quantifiable, saying this is a you know, these are the top hits. So I want to go back, that's it. So um, as to 
Stephen's question, you know, it's what is population transit? population science, what do you get from it? Well, I think there's poor reproducibility of findings across studies. Not so sure we can address that fully, but we can help. Poor generalizability to larger populations is one aspect which is not the same. Um, there is no developmental trajectories, which we will increasingly now with repeated measures do. And um, I think one of the big problems has been, and that's what we, what I didn't address in my answer to you, Stephen, is that um, I think we have overlooked seriously in non-population-based approaches, the effect of behavior on the brain. And only with longitudinal data will we be able to show that. And we show that that comes, in my view, from dementia studies, where we always say, well, we've got dementia, we've got the brain, and then it predicts dementia, which is very true, with very good approach. But I think with five-year-old children, that is different. And there's a good evidence, good reason, good theory, and now data to assume that, you know, and you see that from one of the studies I showed, that if you are very, very anxious, your brain will subtly, but it's all subtle, will develop differently. I don't know that much how that is for ADHD, I doubt, but for traits like aggression, anxiety, I would put my money, it's reasonable. And it's essentially just epidemiology, to be honest. Um, and these are the two students, so it's a true story. He's published very well, he's published okay. But um, it's very sad, he looks like that. But that's it, thank you very much. I'm sorry about this. Yeah. No, you were perfectly on time. Perfectly on time. So I think we've had more than yeah, otherwise people come out. Anyone have a... Or mail or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> All right then. Oh, no questions. Yeah, oh, we'll God. Come, up, oh, come, come on, man. Come up Thank you very much. No, no. All right. Thank you all very much.